What is up, Fence fam? Good morning. Happy Saturday. Hope your guys' week was productive and profitable. I tell you what, here in Missouri, it finally, oh, I was going to say, it finally stopped raining. We had one day of a flood. But other than that, it seems like lately only one day of flooding is great. We're back in business. Hope you guys are having a super great week. Because of all the rainfall we've been having and all the flooding, etc., Today is going to be a short live Q&A because Jackson's got to make up T-ball game at noon. So we got to cut this short at 11. So I'm going to do this uh, for an hour and then get out of here and go co help coach uh, Jackson's T-ball team. Anyway, hope you guys are doing super well. As always, the live Q&A is sponsored by Stain and Seal Experts. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I much appreciate it as always. Now, Stain and Seal Experts isn't just a sponsor. I'm good friends with them. I became good friends with them after using the product and joining Caleb's uh, free Facebook group, Caleb and Ashley, I'm sorry, Ashley, uh, Facebook page, where they provide tons of knowledge. And then I got to know them, became friends with them, and lo and behold, we became uh, partners in this channel. They sponsored this live Q&A. If you guys are looking for Stain, check them out, give them a try. I had tried others in the past, some of the uh, more notable names in the industry, uh, the thing I like about it is it doesn't have the smell. It doesn't have the just the overwhelming smell that you would get from others. Um, and it makes me feel better about putting my guys in contact with it, putting our clients in contact with it, and then their kids and pets. Anyway, I really like it. It's a project I really believe in, which is why this whole sponsorship thing came to be. Like I said, if you guys uh, are looking for saying ceiling, if you're thinking about getting into it, check out the free Facebook group. Tons of good knowledge in there. Everyone there is uh, positive and always willing to help, which you might not also, you might not see in uh, other Facebook groups. Anyway, uh, guys, how are you this morning? I'm going to say hi to a few folks. If you're here, let me know by saying hello in the chat. I always love seeing you guys. I tell you what, you want to talk about dedication to getting in on the stream. No one's beating Roger. I, Roger was here at 730 this morning. He'll drop this comment. Now, I'm glad you didn't wait the whole time. Roger, thank you for showing up. But, but, it's a good reminder to set the reminder. Is that right? To hit the reminder button. Uh, also, don't forget to hit the thumbs up, the like, the whatever the positive interaction is on whichever channel you're watching this on. Uh, it really does help. It legitimately helps with the algorithm. It tells that platform that uh, we're producing content that you guys enjoy watching. It always helps. It is very appreciated. Hello, Finns fam. Roger, hello. Good morning. Oh, spe speaking of Ashley Roth, here she is. Hello. Good morning. Hope you guys are doing super well. And then Roger did come back for the actual start of the live. So good morning, Roger. Again, very good reminder. Let us not forget to hit the thumbs up. Agreed. Shermai, Shermil. Ah, Shermai. It's probably Shermai 1. Shermai 1. Ah, man, I'm butchering this. I apologize. Howdy from Fort Worth, Texas. Good morning. So glad to have you. Kevin. Hey, hey, Kevin from Santa Barbara, California. Boy, what a beautiful place to be. Thanks for all the great content, Joe. You're very, very welcome. Just finished up your talk with Tom Reber. Fantastic person. I mean, fantastic content creator, first and foremost, but legitimately good person. I like Tom a lot. So, Full disclosure, Tom was uh, my business coach for quite a while, and we still stay in touch from time to time. Actually, probably about time to have him back on again. I think we it's probably been a year since he's been on. So, anyway, appreciate you watching the content, tuning in for the live Q&A. If you guys have questions, drop them in the comments below. Slowly but surely, we're getting down there. You guys, If you guys haven't checked out Tom Rear, I mean, Tom's one of these giants in the industry, but if you haven't checked him out, giants in, he's a giant in the, the industry, like the service industry he's uh he's got a contractor fight which and then he's got some training programs as well but contractor fight is totally free it's another totally free facebook group uh whose purpose is to help contractors so anyone with that kind of mission i'm here for it cruz ruiz says how do you replace a post that has rotted and is in asphalt because that's concrete and not dirt <sighs> that's always tough so concrete typically Typically, we'll have to just cut out the con. I mean, asphalt or concrete, really. I mean, you're going to have to cut it out and pull it. Uh, maybe not have to, but that's how we would address it. 
uh, because you're gonna have you're gonna want to make sure that the new post goes in with a new slug of concrete. Make sure it's really nice and secure. Uh, to do that, we would cut probably an eight by eight square around that post, pull it up with a piece of equipment, especially if it's in concrete. Um, jackhammer it probably. So we'll probably do the cut so it's a nice clean cut for the new one to go in. And when we patch it, it looks really nice. Um, but then break out the jackhammer if it's concrete. Uh, asphalt, typically, you definitely want to cut because if you try to pull that post up, it'll pull all the asphalt around it up, and that's not great. So a nice cut keeps that from happening. But 8x8 uh, eight eight cut, typically, and then we would pull it with a piece of equipment. 10x10 10 10 maybe. Depends on the size of the post and the size of the auger you're wanting to dig with. You would obviously want the saw cut to be larger than the auger you plan on using. Mary Kemper Human. Man, I hope I pronounced that correct. Mary. Good morning. Good morning from Texas. That's two votes for Texas. Good morning, guys. And in the opposite direction, Duncan's here. DJ from Ontario, Canada. Good morning, DJ. My question is, my yard is bedrock, like a shelf of it, and we need to put up a fence about 300 foot of it. What is the best way to do this? Have you ever encountered this? We have. So here in Missouri, it's pretty much, all, at least in southwest Missouri, it's pretty much all rock. I mean, it's... This is kind of the one of the funny things is because, you know, sometimes sometimes customers will ask, well, what happens if you hit rock? Because there's some fencing contractors here that have rock clauses. Now, the rock clause typically is if they hit rock in a hole, it's an additional $100 for that hole. The problem is we're in southwest Missouri. Like, literally, the county, the county south of where we're at right now is called Stone County. So we just plan on hitting rock. Like, we just take the rock equipment. And then if we don't hit rock, it's a great day but we typically always hit rock. So, um, so, but you had said shelf rock. So if it's, it, it depends. So if it's chunk rock, we've got, we've got a jackhammer that can, that could pick through it. Uh, if it's solid, if it's a solid shelf rock, typically what we do is just take a core drill, core drill into that rock set to it with some, uh, non shrink hydraulic grout and, uh, and move on. Because once you, once you set that post into the rock, that will be the strongest post of the fence. It's not, you'd have to move the rock before you move the fence. So now 300 foot of it, you've got some holes to cut. So, you know, it depends on the rock, right? But if it's shelf rock, we would typically take a core drill or drill into it. You steel post, obviously, well, I mean, I guess you could use a core drill that's big enough for a wood post, but we would typically go with like a two and a half inch heavy wall post schedule 40 CS 40. And, uh, yeah, core drill into it, set it, make it part of the rock. Like I said, that will be the strongest post of the fence. Hope that helps. Hello from San, Fr San Francisco. Good morning. California is another beautiful place to be. So we got two for Texas and two of California. Given the cost of lumber these days, I was wondering about the pros and cons of galvanized metal, metal posts, and other non-wood products. Uh, thanks. I enjoy your show. Thank you. I appreciate the question. Great questions this morning, guys. Uh, so... Let's address the first part, given the cost of lumber these days. Now, here's the thing. We talked about this a few weeks ago. I'm watching the, let's check out what the lumber ticker is doing right now. So the cost of lumber is actually coming down, which is surprising, but it's happening. So what's funny is, uh, so now we're getting calls from the treated pine reps in our area uh, wanting to make deals to clear out their inventory. Uh, let's see. So let's, let's say lumber. How do we do this? Lumber. Yeah. So let's see. This is making great content, I'm sure. Well, anyway, the price of lumber is coming down. Uh, if you go check out, I believe it's L, the ticker's LBR. Uh, check out the lumber ticker. You'll see that the lumber futures are coming down, which is which means retail prices should be coming down. Now, they don't follow it nearly as closely as you would like it to, meaning if it dropped today, typically it would take a few weeks to see it in the market. Uh, so because these wholesalers ha still have some of the more expensive lumber on the lots now that will make deals on it. And that's kind of what's going on right now. They're, you could typically find a five and a half inch wide, six foot tall tree to pine board for about $1.50 here in our market. Uh, but the quality is still the quality still not great. I, I still don't think it's a value at a dollar fifty. Um, but it is what it is, right? So lumber's coming down. 
what I'm hoping is cedar follows tree to pine. Uh, cedar prices are still fairly expensive. Although I was talking to one of the wholesale cedar wholesalers the other day, um, the price has come down slightly on a five and a half inch wide, six foot tall board. Uh, still at about, I think they were at 388, 389 or something for a board uh, when bought as a truckload. But that's softening a little bit, which is nice to see. Um, so the second part of it, so given the cost of lumber, the quick aside there is that lumber seems to be coming down. The price of lumber seems to be coming down. I was wondering about the pros and cons of galvanized metal. So we use, we use Postmaster Steel Post, which is a purpose-built steel post. Now, there are others out there. There's the lifetime posts, the Gregory posts, those sorts of posts. Um, the problem with those is, I mean, price of steel followed price of wood. Not as quickly, but it has. You know, the price of these steel posts is incredibly expensive. You know, I think in the retail market, uh, if you if you couldn't buy one of these directly, I think the retail price is something like $60, $70 for an eight-foot tall uh, Postmaster post. So still significantly more expensive than wood. Uh, but we like we like installing them not necessarily from a cost savings perspective initially, but for a cost savings perspective from over the life of the fence, right? So these treated pine posts, we're seeing them need replaced at least in our area, uh, eight years, ten years maybe. I mean the treatment in them, there's less treatment, and the treatments obviously changed from fences that are 15, 20 years old. It used to be that you could find some really nice CCA treatment. That would last for quite a while now at least in our market is a mixture of acq and mcq uh, supposedly safer i don't know um but it's they're lasting uh the lifespan is significantly shortened so if the first time you don't have to replace that post you know if you had upgraded to the steel post whether it you know whichever steel post you decide to use uh the first time you don't have to replace that post your money ahead you know, so typically replacing a post, the cost is 100 to $150 plus the cost of the post to, re, you know, remove the fence, remove the post, install a new post, reinstall the fence, easily $100, $150 post. So from that perspective, steel is a deal. Steel is a deal. I like how that rhymed. Um, you know, so more expensive, yes. Over the lifespan of the fence, it will be significantly less expensive. Um it's interesting to see composite start coming on more and more because the price the price upgrade to composite, uh, however, is not that the uh, the difference is a lot lower, right? A lot less. The difference is a lot less. That's what I'm trying to say. The upgrade cost is not nearly what it used to be uh, to go to a composite. So we just wrapped up. It was a it was an eight foot tall composite for a commercial building here in town. And I was really surprised. We had bid both uh, cedar, pre-stained cedar, steel post, and then we priced the composite. And the price difference wasn't that much. Uh, so they ended up going with the composite. Turned into a really nice, uh, really nice fence. We'll probably be showing it on the show in the future. I think we're still probably three or four weeks ahead on the show. So quick aside also, if you guys aren't watching, so every Saturday afternoon, today included, uh, we're showing you guys kind of a behind-the-scenes look of what goes on at Ozark Fence, a week in the life sort of thing, uh, both for myself and for our guys and gals, the team at Ozark Fence, kind of what goes on here. Now, there's a lot of people going in a lot of different directions, and we only have one Braden, but we get a lot of it, and you get a general, good general sense for what goes on here. So, we'll likely, I think we talked about going out there uh, this week or next week to now that everything's done and polished and the con we won't be in the contractor's way. I think we're going to go film that. If you guys aren't watching, check out the show this afternoon. Also welcome to the podcast podcast crowd. I uh, appreciate you guys tuning in. If you guys, uh, if you guys watching live would like to hear this replayed in an audio form, check out the uh, podcast. Absolutely. Anyway, I hope that answered your question there in San Francisco. Let me know if you have more questions. Man, Rod, Roger is the A-team here. He is definitely going to remind us of the hard out because what Roger has learned is that uh, I don't pay attention. I get in the moment, right? I get answering these questions. I've been known to go down a few rabbit holes and lo and behold, blow right past the hard outs. But Roger's here for us. Three Rush says, hello. Hello. Good morning. I'm still a new contractor, and Sharami says, I'm still a new contractor, and I have a client interested in building a blind fence. 
not finding much info on that so far. Any tips or ideas? Thank you. Learning a lot from your channel. Thank. Hey, I appreciate you tuning in and asking these great questions. Uh, describe a blind fence for me. It seems like in different regions, different fences are called different things. So if you could describe the blind fence for me, um, that would definitely help. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not familiar with that term. Um, I'm not familiar with the term of a blind fence. Let me know what if you could describe it for me. I'm sure we could help out. Dan Wheeler, the one, the only, the the pioneer in the fencing podcast realm. It, you, so his intro used to be the first and only fin, uh, podcast for the fence industry, but there's a few of us now that have tiptoed in. Uh, mine at the insistent urging of Dan. A little arm twisting there, but we're here. We're in podcast land, but Dan will always be known as the pioneer of the fence of the podcast fencing podcast. There you go. Uh, good morning, Joe. Good luck at the game. Thank you so much, Dan. I appreciate it. But they're four. So we're still not in the uh, keeping score range yet, but I'll have you know, like we scored what would have been two very legitimate outs yesterday. So if you guys are familiar with T-ball at all, though, they just let them hit, right? You just hit and then run to first. Next kid hits, you run to second. We're working on trying to work on fundamentals. So we're I'm keeping track. Like, let's be honest. I'm keeping track. And uh, we had two very good outs. We had a good first baseman. Anyway, I think we got some talent. This, this four-year-old team's got some talent is what I'm saying. But thank you for the good luck. Cruz, good morning to you, sir. I appreciate you. Ah, rhymes with Jeremy. Jeremy, gotcha. Sorry about that. Michael Babbitt's here with us. Hey, Joe. Hi from northern Michigan. Hello, Michael. Appreciate you joining us. Mr. Pseudo Macho, okay, says, morning, casual viewer who enjoys your informative videos. Keep it up. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it, guys. I really do. Let me know you're here by saying hi and where you're from. I always like interacting with you guys. Also, ask your Fincher-related questions. But remember, we're on a clock here, and it is already 1030. Where is the last 23 minutes gone? Legitimate question. Um, yeah, so get, it, get, your question, get your questions in so that we can get them answered. Joe Ismay says, good morning from Southeast Texas. Texas is representing today. This is like the third or fourth person from Texas. Joe, fellow Joe, good morning. Always good to see fellow Joes in the broadcast. Ian says, hi from Madrid, Spain. Ian, good morning from across. I think you're our first international viewer to say hello. Good morning. How are you? Actually, uh, Madrid, 1030. Good afternoon, I believe it is for you. Fellow Joe says, did you ever find out more about the closed board featherboard fence? So we're still we're still looking into it, is the answer. I know that's not a great answer, right? But I like this idea. I so there's a few problems here. One is that feather feather edge boards aren't aren't a thing here in the States that I can find. Um now could we make our own? Possibly. We would have to split uh so for those of you unfamiliar, so feather edge, so picture a standard picket, right? Just a one inch thick, thick picket, one inch, a, a true one inch. I say thick because mm, sometimes these one inch are closer to five eighths and sometimes five eighths is a bit generous. Um, but picture a full one inch board top down, cut that thing diagonally. Now you're looking at a, essentially a triangle, right? All the way down the length of the board, a feather edge. So it is what it is, right? So you can overlap them really nicely and they stay roughly the same, the same thickness, the same, I don't know. It looks the same, right? Um, I like the idea of feather edge boards. I really do. And so where this, where this started was DNJ projects videos. Uh, actually speaking of gentlemen, I need to talk to in the near future, DNJ projects. If you guys aren't following them and you enjoy fencing content, you absolutely should. Uh, that's kind of where I came in contact with Feather Edge. So they're over. Um, where I see. They're in the UK. They are, man, I'm drawing a blank here. Um, Nottingham. So they're over in the UK. And so they use Feather Edge boards. And so when I was reviewing some of their content and as I got to talking with them on a live, probably roughly um, three or four months ago, by well, the first one was probably a year ago. Anyway, Feather Edge boards. 
right? So I started looking into it, started researching it. They also do a few other things, which is incredibly interesting, i.e. concrete post, concrete H post, and then uh, concrete, what we would call a rot board, they call gravel boards, or some people here call them kickboards, uh, but concrete. Interesting, incredible longevity, one would think, really durable. Uh, so I've been looking into it. Unfortunately, here in the States, the infrastructure isn't really set up for these. Like these products aren't necessarily a thing. I say that there is a company in the Southeast that I did find that is making the concrete post, uh, the concrete post. I didn't, I found the forms for the concrete, uh, what we'd call a rot board or kickboard, what they would call a gravel board. Um, I don't know. Still in, let's say this whole thing is still a work in progress. We've got a few other irons in the fire right now. We're, if you guys follow me on TikTok, shameless plug, follow me on TikTok to learn more about our e-commerce business. We're growing. We're selling fence fittings online at ozfence.store. Um, that's taking a tremendous amount of my attention. Also, we're starting a wire weaving up wire we wire weaving company um, late summer, early fall ish. Uh, Ozark Wireworks. So, few irons in the fire, getting pulled a couple different directions. But this is on the list. Researching more about the featherboard fencing styles and seeing if we can't bring a new style to a our market or maybe our region or the country i don't know we'll see um this is something i'm really interested in the feather edge boards is a thing though because we're not not that i can find now if you contracted with a custom lumber mill i'm sure we could probably make some feather edge boards but anyway very long answer the short version is we're still looking into it it's still on my radar Primescape Construction, Fence Builders and Stain. Good morning from Livingston, Louisiana. Good morning to you, Primescape. Appreciate you guys joining us. Dylan Thomas Gorley. Buddy, how are you? Dylan is one of my longest and oldest friends. Well, not oldest. I think technically he's younger than I am. But you guys get it. You guys, He and I have been buddies for a while. Actually, since we moved back. Uh, Dylan was one of my first friends that I made when we moved back to Missouri. Let's see, fifth grade, so 12 years old, I guess, right? 11, 12, something like that. Um, yeah, Dylan, good morning. So Dylan actually just took the leap, uh, bought a business, and he is now his own boss. Dylan, congratulations. Appreciate you joining me. And this is this is a good example. This is one of the benefits of uh, taking a leap on your own, right? So usually Dylan would be, uh, Dylan would be working for someone else right now. I'm not able to join the broadcast, but since he took the leap, here he is. Dylan, good morning. Duncan McDonald says, as opposed to using a core drill, could you drill into the rock and put a post anchor and then add adhesive to the drilled hole and then put post in the concrete? As opposed to using a core drill. See, I don't. Okay. It sounds like you're talking about a core drill, though. Could you drill into the rock and put a post anchor? So, or are you talking about wedge? It? Okay, so maybe we're talking. Mm, but I don't understand the adhesive part of this. You could. So you could also plate a post. You drill into the rock and use concrete anchors. Wedge anchors uh, is what we'd prefer. They all, Redhead also makes a different forms of anchors. But wedge anchors is kind of what we really like using. Um could you drill into the rock and put a post anchor and then add adhesive to the drilled hole and then put a post in the concrete? Then put post in the concrete. I'm not sure. Duncan, I'm probably missing the question here. Um, as opposed to using a core drill, but then you said, I don't know. Uh, I'm probably not understanding and I apologize. Uh, you, There are multiple ways of doing this. I like the core drilling method because... It doesn't require we have a fabrication shop we can weld we can weld flanges on all these the thing is if you're 45 minutes away so you send it now hopefully when you were doing your exploratory meeting there at the at the property you notice that there's a lot of rock and you kind of prepared your guys for that um, but if all these posts need flanges or post plates or whatever you'd like to call them um you would you'd obviously need to weld those up beforehand um whereas if you had non non shrink grout and you had the core drill on the po on the truck, which typically we do for such an instance, and you had four or five of them that needed done, you could do them on the spot, right? Without having to return to the shop or 
have a runner sent out to the job site with uh, these modified posts. Could you? Absolutely. Listen, this is kind of the overarching theme here is that this is one guy's opinion, right? This is my opinion on how I've seen my family do it over the generations. However, this isn't the only way, right? I'm sure there are other ways. Arguably, a lot of them are probably better, but this is how we do it, right? This is how we found that works in our process and works for our company. There are other ways. JD, good morning. JD Pax here with us. Hey, Joe. JD, I met JD over uh, over in New Orleans, down in New Orleans. This whole down in New Orleans, and then uh, JD also made a feature on the. Great. What are we calling the series where we share the fence life stories? No, nope, not fence life. My fence story. There you go. Listen, I'm not trying to step on toes here. I'm trying to figure out what to call this without it sounding similar to Danny Cannon show, My Fence Life. Also, if you guys are following Danny Cannon show, you should be My Fence Life. They're uh, predominantly on Facebook. They do a Facebook Q&A, uh, but they also now are on podcast. But uh, My Fence Story, where basically uh, we sit down with a fencing contractor and have them share their story with us on how they got into fencing, what they like about fencing, how they've seen uh, success in fencing, that sort of thing. Because... I like to hear other people's stories. I like to learn more about what got them into the industry and what they love about the industry. And I think you guys do too. Uh, also, it's good to document these stories because a lot of these people, JD included, I think will become giants in the industry. And it's great to document kind of where they came from before they turned into giants of the industry. Now, we've also interviewed a couple of giants, i.e. Mr. Matt Warner. So we're kind of doing both. We're catching guys before they become giants. But then also trying to take advantage of documenting these these current giants of the industry, uh, document their stories. So anyway, JD, good morning, good to see you. Jacob Hughes says, "Good morning. I am planning on installing a solid board six foot privacy fence. How much of a gap should I leave between my pickets to allow for wood to expand and contract? Uh, depends on the lumber, I guess. However, you don't leave. Typically, you don't leave a gap. So if you're using treated pine." or a western red cedar and i'm i'll explain this in a second those boards you would you would install them next to each other because those boards are typically going to dry out and shrink slightly cedar not so much as treated pine in our experience in our market i feel like i have to say that all the time now because other people have different experiences i suppose but uh cedar typically gap something like a quarter inch some ish plus or minus uh, where treated pine might gap up to a half an inch now, the caveat to this is I all I talked to other contractors. We haven't used a Japanese cedar product as far as the pickets go. We have used JPC, uh, Japanese cedar, on the 2 before 8s I like them. I think they're a quality product. However, the pickets, we haven't used. Our, our wholesalers just simply don't care them in our region. Other guys do have them and have used them, and those are the boards that seem to swell, where they'll install them similar to installing a treated pine or western red cedar, but then the boards will act. So they're, the thought is that they're all kiln dried. So when they come into our environment and they soak up the humidities, particularly in the southern states, likely, uh, they swell up and they would buckle. They would buck the nails and they would start pulling away from the, from the structure. Uh, I haven't seen that. However, I have talked to several fence guys that I know and I full, full well trust, and they have had that experience. So I don't doubt it. Um, if you're asking me, though, what our process is for treated pine and western red cedar, we would butt those boards up next to each other. We want them as tight as possible to reduce gapping as much as possible. So, depends on the product, I guess is the answer, Jacob. But if you're using a treated pine or a western red cedar, actually, and, and we did the same process when using eastern red cedar as well, you need to, I guess you need to clarify, is the board kiln dried? Is it just incredibly dry before it gets to you? Now, the whole kiln dried thing is kind of crazy to see in the fencing industry. Like typically, typically the, the lumber manufacturers aren't investing in kiln drying equipment and the time it takes to dry it. They're just shipping it out wet because it will dry along the way. And fence guys that don't stain aren't necessarily worried or concerned about the moisture content. But you got to think these boards are making a trip across an ocean where every pound counts. So they've done the, whoever is producing these boards has done the numbers and realized that they do invest in the equipment and a time to kiln dry these boards, it's less way to ship. So anyway, 
depends on the product, I guess, Jacob. But treated pine or western or eastern cedar, I would suggest butting them up tight, nice and tight with each other to reduce the gapping. If you're using a JPC product or Japanese cedar product or a product that is kiln dried, you would want, you know, you would probably want to gap it a quarter inch, I would guess. I don't have experience with it, so at that point I'm guessing, but it, I hope that helps, Jacob. I really do. David Hernandez, good morning. This is Landscaping by A&D LLC. Good morning, David, and Landscaping by A&D. What's the fastest way to set up posts? What I mean is the fastest way to set a bunch of posts on a long run. One guy's opinion, right? So uh, a gentleman named Sean King, Mr. Fence, has a tool called the Equalizer. It is, I think, a uh, bungee cord with predetermined uh, measurements on it. It has tabs where every post would be set this will cause a conversation i'm sure i fully understand a lot of people feel that their method of using a string line and measuring is faster could be i've seen it demonstrated we use it i feel that the equalizer is faster over a long run it's as simple as counting out how many posts finding that tab obviously anchoring your starting point and pulling till it's taut now you know Every post is properly spaced without measuring out each post and marking each post. And anyway, check out the Equalizer product. I don't sell it. I don't get a commission on it. It's a product that we legitimately use on our crews, and I feel like it's faster. I'm I'm saying all this because literally there was a conversation this morning in one of the groups, uh, or I was reading it this morning um, on this particular subject. So. Opinions may differ, I guess is the good way to put it. If you're asking me, though, my my opinion is the Equalizer is a good product, and I think you should try it. Duncan says yes. Um, sorry, Duncan. I'm not – the so we were talking about cord rolling. I, yes was an answer to one of the questions. I don't remember the questions I asked, though, so I apologize. But, Duncan, you are welcome. Duncan says thank you. Duncan, you are welcome. I had to – I have to remember, I need to read out all of this because folks are listening on the podcast now, which is a different, uh, it's a mental shift. You got to think a little bit differently about this. Roger says, Hilti makes an epoxy for concrete and bedrock adhesion, and one could use that type of application. Not sure uh, what type of strength in regards to shear and tensile would be. Yeah, I mean, we, we could definitely try it out. Uh, Hilti is a very well-known brand, um, known for making very good equipment. Uh, so I, it would probably be worth trying. Absolutely. Um, you know, I try to share my experience and I try not to guess too much in this because guessing is just that, right? And an and educated guess, right? But I would rather just share experiences than try to guess. Um, I wouldn't want to lead someone astray is the whole thing. Guys, I appreciate you guys. If you've got any last minute, I say last minute questions. It's only 10 for We've got 20 minutes. we got 20 minutes, Joe. Calm down. Still got some runway here. You guys have questions? Drop them in the comments below. Fellow Joe says, thanks for the answer, Joe. You're welcome, fellow Joe. Appreciate you joining us. Uh, David says, thank you. Does it equalizer and help you level the post? So it doesn't as well as I'm having. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Does the equalizer help you level the post as well? I'm having a problem of taking too long to level post. It just takes me a long time sometimes. It doesn't. So the equalizer will help space those posts out proportionally uh, without having to measure each post. I mean, you could always measure. If you're uh, installing a product that requires an exact measurement, you'd probably want to just check a few to be sure. Um, but if we're talking about wood wood privacy fence, it's absolutely acceptable. Um, it doesn't help level the post, plumb the post. And I'm, I'm correcting here because... There's been some conversations in some of my YouTube videos about the differences between level and plumb. Now, when you said level the post, I absolutely understand exactly what you mean because that was the terminology that I was taught and used as a kid. However, the proper terminology from the YouTube comments section is plumb. You plumb the post. I got what you meant. Um, it's taking too long to uh, level the post. It you get You get better at it, I guess is what I'm... What I'm going to say, um, you can eyeball them once you get used to once you get used to installing it, and you your eye kind of calibrates to what a plumb post looks like. 
Uh, you can typically get it close eyeball. You want to check it with a two foot level. I would suggest two foot or four foot level. The longer the level, the better, especially when working with wood posts. The problem, and Sean, Sean talks about this uh, a lot in his videos, the torpedo levels are so small that they give you, they're only accurate for their length. So in a wood post, if it has a bow in it, it depends where you measure as to is this thing level. Now, the longer the level you use, the the greater percentage of the post you are taking into account of the when you're measuring the plumb or with the level, right? So I like four foot levels. Now they are long, they are unhandy to store and to keep stored correctly. But when we're measuring a post that's six foot out of the ground, a four foot level is going to give you the majority. You're measuring the majority of that post, right? It's not fast. It's not incredibly fast in the beginning. It's really not. Now, as you or your crew chiefs have gained more experience with this, it will become faster. They can typically they can typically plumb one post, eyeball in the next two or three posts, check them, of course, but it becomes faster as you develop that process. Um, there isn't, I mean, outside of a, of a longer level, there's not really a tool that increases the speed of that, though. Uh, of all the of all the things in the process that you'd want to spend time on, though, that's probably one of the more important ones. I'm totally fine with a new or green crew taking longer to plumb or level these posts. Uh, that is something we need to get exactly right because the consequence is the post gets pulled, right? And uh, I would certainly rather them take a few extra minutes leveling or plumbing than to take significantly longer to replace these posts. I have to pull them out. Hope that helps, David. Appreciate the great questions. Scrub Scrub T Zero says, "Am I in trouble if I put my four by four fence post four foot deep with just dirt and no concrete? I tamp the dirt down." This is a conversation that's going on in the industry right now. Um, I, talk to the 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 ag guys do this all the time, right? I, I say that the comments I see in my feed from the ag industry is that this is totally normal, right? Well, I mean, there's guys out there. There's a lot of ag guys, a lot of guys in general, but specifically ag guys that are driving posts, right? So they're driving these posts three, four foot in the ground or more and having great success. I mean, it's a time tested method. So what you're describing, tamping dirt back in when we're talking about, well, and you said, am I in trouble? I, there as of yet, there is no fence police, so you will not actually be in trouble. But uh, the method you're describing, tamping dirt back down into the hole, would be similar to driving the post. So when you say you're in trouble, it, you know, if, in terms of maybe, um, depends what trouble is, right? So if you're talking about having trouble with rot or corrosion on the post, maybe. But there's the conversation going on right now about, is the acidity in the concrete, the lime and whatnot, is it contributing to accelerated rot in wood posts or accelerated corrosion in galvanized posts, steel posts? It's, there's no conclusive answer right now, right? Um, now, if you are doing this, a four before, presumably wood post, put directly into the dirt, I would recommend using a barrier product to put a barrier between that wood post and the soil. So rot is predominantly caused by the, the microbes and microfauna in the soil in that first six, eight, 10 inches. Uh, that is the aerobic zone of the soil. I mean, wood posts hold moisture. So the microfauna is wanting to get at that moisture and the nutrients that that wood fiber might have in it. So using a, there's several products out there. Uh, Post Saver is a product that I would recommend um, to provide a barrier between your post and that soil. I hope that helps. But in terms of structural integrity, I mean, it depends on your method for camping the dirt in as long as you're camping in layers, right? So you're not just dumping the dirt in and just trying to compress the whole column of dirt. Won't have great results with that. But as long as you're tamping you know, in layers, you should be okay. It should be fine in terms of structural integrity. Should be just fine. Uh, but like I said, use a barrier between the wood post and the uh, outside world and the soil around it. 
for best success if we're talking about uh, raw success sort of thing. David says, thank you so much. I've been using a torpedo level the whole time. Totally common, though, David. Don't feel you did the laugh out loud. I hope you're not laughing at yourself because this is completely common in, in a lot of industries. I mean, they, they sell those things by the millions, I bet, every year. Um, so don't don't feel like it's just you. There's a lot of that out there. Uh, we've been open for two years, and business has been awesome. David, I love it. I love that so much. And contractors like yourself is why we do this. We being the collective part of the industry that is creating content like this or doing training or what have you. Uh, you are the you are the future of the industry. You know, new contractors now are the ones, hopefully, that will be the thought leaders in the industry 20 years from now, right? 30 years from now, something like that. So welcome. Glad you're here. Keep asking great questions. These aren't silly questions. These aren't, what is it? The only dumb question is the one that doesn't get asked, right? So ask away. Let's try to get, let's try to get some help for you. Not, th not saying you need help, but you get what I mean. So Scrub T Zero was saying, uh, is he in trouble for setting and tamping dirt like falling over? Not if it's compressed properly, right? So as long as that, long as you're compressing that dirt in layers, so think five or six layers. So what'd you say, four foot? You'd probably want eight or nine layers at least. You'd want to, you'd want to pour dirt, dirt in, tamp it, more dirt, tamp it, more dirt, tamp it, tamp it in layers so that each layer is compressed. You should be fine. Thank you. Makes me feel better. You're very welcome. This is what this show is about. Asking fencing related questions. I'd love to share my experience with you for sure. All right. Good deal. Scrub D0 says he's tamping the layers. Good deal. Also says, awesome, man. I'll have to do the next areas with a barrier. It's you should check it out. I mean, it, it makes sense. The more that we have conversations like this, the more conversations I have outside of this show, but around the fencing related industry, it seems like those products are, are kind of where it's going. The, this particular product, I know more about it because I've talked to more people that use it than uh, I'm sure there's other products out there. But this one was developed over in the UK where they get a tremendous amount of rain, where rot is a very real problem. Uh, it is a real problem here as well, but more so there, just due to annual rainfall. Uh, if it's time tested over there and it does well, it should do well in a drier climate than what than like what you see here. Now it's hard to say drier climate because like I said we've been getting quite a bit of flooding in the last month and a half, two months. Uh, but come July and August, we'll be wishing for rain. It'll be bone dry and every, the dirt will be hard, and we'll be wishing for rain again. Michael Babbitt says, "So I use, so I got to use my new Rhino driver here in Michigan. Congrats! It is so much faster. If I had ten foot Postmaster post." Uh, or I had 10 foot postmaster post, drove them four foot six inches down. It worked amazingly. Michael, I'm so happy for you. I really am. I watch videos of, of guys with experience like yourselves that these things just sink in, and I am incredibly jealous. We live in an area that has rock, predominantly rocks in the the majority of the geography in our area. Uh, unfortunately, driving isn't isn't a thing here. Uh, but congratulations, I think you will find massive success with it. Um, it, I'm sure you already do, but if you don't, you should check out SWI's channel. They talk about driving posts quite a bit, quite a bit, and they're kind of up in the northern areas. They're up in Wyoming. Um, so not saying the geography is exactly the same as what you guys see in Michigan, uh, but it sounds similar in that they drive posts with great success. And here's the thing, 10 foot post, you drove it four foot, six inches in the ground. That post is there to stay. It's not going anywhere. So you provided an incredibly strong post quickly and efficiently, which will in turn drive down your labor cost, which could, should, I don't know, equal a savings for your client. It's a win all the way around. It'll also help you out in the future if, uh, in terms of repairing. If you ever need to repair the post, you could pull it a lot easier than if it were surrounded with concrete. Congrats. Let us know, let us know how your process continues. I'm, I'm always, I'm always love to learn about new, uh, new procedures. Jeremy Townsend says, good morning, Joe. Another question from Texas. What, what is up, Texas? Texas is on fire today. Do you guys pre-stain lumber? 
If so, do you dip or you stain track? What are the pros and cons to each method? We do pre-stain. I prefer pre-stain for several reasons. One, we get stain boards in any way. I was going to say 365 days a year. Let's be honest. That's not happening. We're not staining boards every day of every year. Every day of every, yeah, all year. You get what I mean. But we can stain in the wintertime. We can stain when it's raining. We can stain We can stain any day we would like to uh, by using pre-staining. Now, we have a covered facility. That our facility is enclosed, but uh, a lot of guys I talked to, we were talking to a contractor a little bit ago that simply had a covered area that they were pre-staining. Perfect, right? I prefer it. You get all six sides, all six faces of the lumber. It's a nice, full, consistent stain applied to the board. So, yes, we pre-stain lumber. If so, do you dip or you stain track? We have done both. Because we have the space available now, we dip. I've used a stain track machine before. Because of our situation here, we dip. Either People have found success with both is what I'm going to say. In our process, it works Better for us to dip them. Uh, what are the pros and cons to each method? Dipping puts the board in contact with the stain for longer, I feel like. That being said, for several years, we I don't want this to sound like I, I don't like stain track. I do. We used it for several years. The fence at my house was originally stained with the stain track machine. Okay? Now, we do pre-dip now because it's a... Arguably, it could be faster or slower, depending on who's using it. I've seen the guys at Stain Track use that use their Stain Track machine, and they can fly through it. The only thing I'm going to say is you might find more trouble using it if you use a thicker stain. Now, they're modifying it. I understand there's they're taking steps, as we speak, likely, to modify it to take thicker stains, such as the Stain Steel Expert stain. Um, one of the reasons we switched because it's a thicker stain. It clogs a little bit more easily when running through a, a closed system that has, you know, nozzles that is trying to force the stain through. It was a more consistent, it was a more consistently applied stain when we were dipping it. Um, but like I say, my fence had it. Now we recently this year uh, reapplied stain on site. We did a maintenance coat just to keep it looking really fresh. You can't be a fence guy and have a fence that's not up to par. But um, if you've got the space, I recommend dipping it. Stain track is great for staining on site, though. I mean, that's going to be one of the pros of the stain track machine is you could stain on site. You could stain at the customer's location. I wouldn't recommend it. One of the reasons that we're pre-staining is so that we can leave the, we don't have to do a lot of prep work on site. It doesn't matter if it's windy or what. We can have a controlled environment that we're pre staining in, take it to the customer's job site. No worry about cleanup or mess or anything. But it's fully, the stain track system is fully mobile. So there is definitely that. I hope that helps. If you, if you've got the room for it, if you've got the space where you can pre stain or pre dip, I would recommend that. The reason, one of the benefits to us of using the stain track machine, though, was before we had this building, we didn't have space to do pre-staining. We did pre-staining out. We brought in some containers, some shipping containers, and we would pre-stain out of those containers. So we would we needed a system to where we could bring out of the container, set it up, set it up to stain. We put a one of the portable tents up to keep the sun off of us, and we'd run stain boards through there, stack them in a different container to drip and dry. Worked out pretty well. In that situation, stain track machine shines because it's fully, excuse me, fully portable. Uh, but if you have the space where you can put it, you've got some space you can dedicate to staining. I think dipping might might have a few more advantages over the stain track machine. I'm saying this because I, I really like I really like the guys over at stain track. I they're legitimately good guys, and they're trying to solve a problem in the industry. I I applaud that for sure. Both work, but if you can have a dedicated space, I would probably dip. Scrub T0 says, I couldn't afford to get metal post, totally fine, but decided to not to do cement to save money and the fact that I put the put the post four foot in the ground, your 10-foot post, tamp, tamped layer by layer of dirt. Perfect. I mean, I, I think it sounds like you've got an incredibly strong fence. I think you did it really right. I absolutely understand I, not being able to afford metal posts. They are incredibly expensive now. 
I mean, there for probably six months, they hadn't jumped up yet. Woodpost had jumped up. So there was a time there where Woodpost were only a few dollars a piece difference and or metal posts were only a few dollars a piece uh, difference. So you would go with those ones. But now they caught up to everything and they're, they are sky high at the moment. Can't fault you there at all. Roger is always helping out. 10 minute warning. So adds a moment. I'm glad you said that because it made me look at my phone. We got five, four minutes. Phil says, how do I turn a 90 degree corner with Postmaster on a horizontal fence installation? So they make, Postmaster makes specific post four corners that you could use. Uh, we typically use what they now call the line post, even for 90 degree corners. Um, you would, I mean, you would be screwing into the end grain rather than the side grain. That's not how, the, that's not the right word for that, but I think you get what I mean. Um, one, you would basically be turning one of the two by fours on edge and screwing into the end grain. Now, typically we would run three screws in just to be safe. Um, but, but Phil, the, the probably technically the, by the book way would, would be to use a corner post supplied by master. Alco. Vince defense says, good morning, Joe. Another question from Texas. Do you guys pre say, Oh, we already answered that. All right, so Jeremy is also fence to fence. Now we know. Got it. Sorry. Fellow Joe says, saw a bit of a fellow in New Zealand using those post wraps. They were put on by the fence suppliers. Yeah, so here in the States, depending on the region, we do have suppliers that do that as well. Um, you know, in full transparency, something we're looking into. It, we offer retail wholesale both on-site and online. Now, if we pre-wrap the post, they obviously wouldn't be available online because freight shipping those things gets a little crazy. Ken Throckmorton's in the house. House of New Venture coming along, machines, etc. It's plugging right along. We're still, we're kind of in a holding pattern waiting for the machines to be done and shipped. As far as, as far as I'm being told, I send out an email, but just about weekly, and the email responses are starting to sound pretty similar. Still shooting for mid-August, everything's go. So, Mid-August is what we're shooting for. We should get the new building or new to us building uh, next month, the 1st of July. So that's coming right up. Um, yeah, everything's still good to go. Everything's everything's good. So we do need to meet the electricians over there just to see what we need to do to the electrical system to accommodate the machines. Um, but, yeah, everything's, everything is green. All the lights are green. Walt Dennis, what is up, Joe? Talk about another guy from Texas. Texas is just representing in the house today. Good morning, Walt. Good to see you. Michael Babbitt says, I'm dipping boards right now as I listen to your show. Very good. I made a short video yesterday for my site to show what and why people should consider this route. I made my vat with materials I already had. I like this a lot, Michael. I like the idea also of you educating your customers, consumers, clients, whatever you'd prefer to call them, on the benefits of it. I think there's just a lot of unknown out there when it comes to staining fence. I applaud you for leading, by, leading through education. Roger says, time to go, at least by the time you read this. <laughs> You're not wrong. We got one minute. Divine Fence says, hello, Joe and Fence fam. Hope hope has been a great week is, is how I'm going to read that. Divine, thank you so much for showing up. As always, Divine Fence is one of those families that continues to show up week after week. Landmark Creations, what's up, Kevin? Appreciate all you do for the industry, Joe. Thank you so much. Hope all the Fence fam have a great weekend. I absolutely agree. Guys. As Roger has reminded us, we've got a hard out at 11 o'clock. I got to go help Coach Jackson's T-ball team. Has it been an hour already? Has it really? Like, literally, my clock says it. The countdown timer says it has been. I don't believe it. It doesn't feel like an hour. These things fly by. Fantastic questions. I appreciate them so much because they help this show fly by. If you have future questions, if you're watching this as a recording, or if I just didn't answer the question that you had in, in time, Drop it in the comments below. I always love watching the comments, and I try to answer them as they come through. I love interacting with you guys through the week in the comments section. Till next time, I'm Joe Everest, the fence expert, reminding you the good fences make good neighbors, and I'll see you guys next week.